Welcome back, everybody, um, from your break. I hope you availed of the time and got yourself a refreshment, a coffee, a tea, some water. I know I have and had a little chat backstage. Um, we're going to be joined again um, for um, the discussion. And it really is a discussion um, that we wanted to have about what we've learned over the pandemic and what elements of that would we be bringing into the future. Um, again, we're going to be joined by Raf and um, Mandy. So they're going to stay with us for the discussion. Thanks for that, um, Raf and Mandy. And your discussion and co-production experts by experience, so powerful, genuinely. And, and thank you so much for, for putting that together. Um, especially you, Raf, as you, you, you know, you held the lion's share there, although you did have a wonderful assistant with you, has to be said. Um, we're also going to be joined by Rob. So, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself just so that everybody knows who you are? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Silito. I'm the Reducing Restrictive Practice Lead at North Dask Combined Healthcare. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Um, we're also being joined by Chris Sterling um, of CPI. So, Chris, will you do um, uh, just an introduction? Hi, I'm uh, Chris Sterling. I'm Senior Vice President at CPI and uh, oversee uh, research and development around the training programs. Thanks, Chris. And just in case people are wondering who I am, um, I'm Chris Sheehan um, from the Christ Prevention Institute as well, and I'm the Director of Training, um, more so for the adult programs, as uh, there is a co-director, um, Maria, um, who I work alongside, who you will meet um, tomorrow, tomorrow's um, conference. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, to the side, you will see a question and answer um, bar there. So if there are questions that you want to pose to the panel as the discussion goes on, please enter um, the questions. Please, speak, please stick them into the, um, the Q&A portion of the chat box rather than the chats itself so that we can um, really pay attention to those pieces. Um, I think what we want to do this afternoon really is expand on the discussion that Mandy and Raf have already um, started, really, um, which is where are we going to, what have we learned, what are we going to bring with us from, from that. Um, but before we start, I would like to just put a poll out. I just want to kind of get a sense of um, where people are at themselves. And the poll question going to be posed to you right now, which is, can blended learning completely replace face-to-face -face training? We just want to get a measurement of where you at. Uh, where are your thoughts on um, at that? Can it? Can it not? Is it? Is it a combination of? Um, so we're just going to pose that, and you'll see again on the left-hand side. There's a box. There's a red dot after appearing with the poll um, in there. So let's just start with a question, um, guys, if you don't mind. Um, so, how, well, how have the past 18 months been for your organization, the organizations <coughs> representing here to, today, um, in terms of fulfilling um, the training needs of your staff? I'll go on that one. I think uh, Rob's probably in the same position as I am organizationally. Obviously, we're from two different organizations. But um, I think the requirements to train the staff particularly those early few weeks when we went into lockdown was quite challenging. Um, it was scary. We obviously the, the training that we do involves very close contact with individuals. Um, but I am absolutely blown away by how um, individuals and um, people, particularly you know, within my team, my department, adapted um, and how we've gone actually probably to, to do things better what we did before you know there's an assumption that you had to do everything in a certain way and i think what the pandemic did was it opened people's minds up to doing things differently and actually what is meant by face to face isn't necessarily person to person where you're within touching distance it can be something like this for, for sure and i think really what you're saying um affected us all those early weeks were really scary of the pandemic um how are we going to do this how are we going to continue Rob, was the experience the same for you? Very similar, actually. Yeah, we had to cancel face-to-face -face training at some a couple of points. Actually, we we were one of the first to restart it, uh, and then because of the second lockdown, we had to 
stop it again. Uh, so we've only recently, well, since May this year, restarted again. Um, but like Mandy says, people adapt to how people have adapted. I've just been looking, I, I did a, C, I pull, a blog for CPI, just been looking to make sure I wasn't wearing the same shirt as I was on the CPI blog. And, and the same with Raf, actually. I think I've, I've lost a bit of weight since then, which is quite a bonus. Um, but looking at the blog, it was how the, the, training, the training team themselves, but also the staff that, c that came to the training adapted to the new ways of working, new training venue. We went into a sports hall, which wasn't fantastic for um, the echo uh, and the facilitation and the communication, the conversation we were having, but uh, the, how the staff are adapted and how we've managed to move on from there. We're actually getting a new training venue um, in the, well, the next coming weeks, actually, uh, which will hopefully a bit, be a bit better than the sports hall. For sure. And I mean, you've all that combined with then the regulations were changing on a daily basis, the recommendations, COVID safe classrooms. Chris, you had a, you had a lot to um, kind of guide us through for those early, early months. I think um, it, it affected us, us as a training provider <clears throat> and equally the customers we work with affected them doubly, I guess, in terms of making sure frontline services were safe. And part of that is to make sure staff have the right knowledge and skills. I think for me, the interesting thing in, uh, that the pandemic created is a, a kind of, and Mandy touched on it, a bit of a mind shift really. We, we, we'd offered blended training opportunities um, of our, our programs for quite a number of years, but nobody was interested in them. It was almost that people didn't believe it was effective. Um, and maybe that's down to people's personal experiences. I'm sure a lot of people have done like, uh, some online training where really it's just you click through a series of PowerPoint slides and then there's a quiz at the end and, and you know, I've done it lots of times. Uh, you just actually get to the end just so you can answer the questions and you get to that, you, can, you can get through it. So I think people's view on, on, on Blendy was taint, tainted. But I think that what the pandemic did is, I, I think for me, is it, it created a catalyst to, for people to consider that blended learning is effective. But what it did for CPI, um, and again, I think kind of some of the work Raf and Mandy were talking about, it, it, it kick-started um, a development process where we, we focus really heavily on what is the quality of the online portion? How do you enrich that learning with uh, effective facilitation, use of videos? So it isn't something people just click through. Um, so, so I think it's it's kind of started off quite scary, um, but I think it's brought so certainly uh, from a training perspective us to, to quite a good place. And I think what it what it's allowed us to do now uh, is to create greater flexibility for organizations in terms of how they wish to train their staff. You know, some organizations are really well well set up for blended type delivery and others not so. So I think what, what where it's got us to is a place where we allow the, 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 the customer, the organization, the flexibility to do it in the way that best suits them. So yeah, not, not great at the beginning, but I think it's got us to a good place now. Sure, thanks, Chris. And and the thing I, I think when we start to think about um, those early months, weeks, and months, and us all learning, um, people being um, extremely anxious. Um, I think we, we have to think about what was it like for the staff member who knew I need this training. This training is what keeps me safe. We're 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 going into a time where potentially. Um, people, because of their anxiety rising, etc., it can be, um, I, I guess, present more behaviours, etc. Um, have any of you had any experience of that, where staff were quite concerned about, I need the training, but but you're not providing it in the way that suits me, etc. I can speak on that, but I suppose when we first went into lockdown, I was in a dual role. I was working in infection prevention and control and also the reduced restricted practices. So I had a, a hand in both parts, a finger in both parts really. So I could answer the questions quite effectively when people were asking me questions around why aren't we doing MAPA training? When are we restarted? Is it safe to do, is it safe to restart? Because I had that knowledge of what was going on with the lockdowns and I suppose what was going on locally within a locality of North, of North Staffordshire. Um, so I was able to answer them questions, but still the anxiety was quite evident from 
the trainers, but also the participants as well. It was like, can we do this effectively? Can we do this safely? What what things are we putting into place? And we've we've had to um, put a, pre a brief presentation to say what we are doing to mitigate against, against the risks. Although it's quite evident that we've had to expand the the area where we're delivering training because of social distancing, always wearing masks, the hand sanitizer, but what, explaining that in first hand to the person that's in there at the same time, hopefully will trying to alleviate some of that anxiety. Um, I don't know, I no longer work in RPC, so I can't really say that anymore, but um, it does help, it did help anyway. I think having the correct information and being transparent about it was, was really the most direct way of answering those questions. Yeah, absolutely, I think, I think it was, it was, people came to me working in infection control for, we're only a small organization, so I was able to go out to it to most of the areas and explain what we were doing with regards to mapping uh, face to face, which in a big organization, potentially like Signet or another trust out there that's bigger, that might not be able to do it right face to face, might have been via email, via Teams. Uh, but I had the luxury of being able to go to individual teams and explain, well, this is what we're doing. This is why we're starting with, with five day courses. This is why we're, we're going to start looking at refreshers. And this is why we've had to stop again. Um, and, just, just, I suppose, again, I keep bringing the word back in, but adaptations change to the way that could working in infection control, especially things were changing minute by minute, never mind day by day, it was minute by minute at the start. Um, so it was quite a challenging time. Yeah, and I, I see lots of, of comments coming in um, as well. I mean, things that, that, that we're talking about, finding even um, training venues being really, really difficult around the country, both here um, also in Ireland, um, and even in Ireland right now, um, would they're not permitted to ask somebody if they're vaccinated or not while attending the training. So that creates its um, own limitation. And as, as our colleague is describing it, somewhat of a minefield in, in some ways. Um, some people are asking um, if more of our CPI programs are going to become blended um, in the future, um, specifically clinical holding. Um, and there will be news coming up on, on that. Um, certainly by the end of the year, we'll be getting a communication out. But we've started to look at all our programs. Um, but I, I think I don't want you to kind of get into specific programs here, here today, if, if that is okay. Um, I just, I just I, yeah, Chris, hey Chris, if, sorry. If either Rob or, or, or Mandy, you know, um, has as the pandemic and uh, the the switch in the the more acceptance of blended learning is, is that something that you as an all as your all respective organisations is that the direction you're going? You're looking at all all the training that you provide and whether or not there can be a blended option. Because I guess one of the things that Blended has been able to help is it allows people to access training that previously would have been only face to face. And I think for, for certainly the, a lot of the training we provide, there will always be an element of face to face when you're, you're helping people to develop skills and apply skills. So, but I just wondered, you know, what, what you'd done in terms of your own, your own organisations. So from my perspective, um, from Sigmund's perspective, we very quickly had to look at everything we were doing um, and look at what was going to keep our staff safe, particularly those new staff, because we were still recruiting, staff were still coming into our services. So we really did need to keep people safe. And that meant looking at all the other face-to-face -face training that we did and how we could adapt that very quickly. So we put a number of things in place from, from our organisation's perspective. We looked at um, where there was blended learning that we maybe trained in smaller groups. But, you know, seen in the chat a lot of people struggling with venues. We actually trained in smaller groups at the venues. But the groups weren't mixing with each other. So, you know, when you've got an organisation on site, you might have five or six sites all come together to reduce the um, number of people from each service off shift at any one time. Well, in order to reduce the infection, you know, we were going to sites, um, which reduce the capacity of our team to deliver training. But what we did organization was make a decision to extend the refresher time around that training. 
So what we're now doing as part of our recovery plan is actually bringing that down to the refresher time that we feel that works for our organisation being back to the 12 month period. But to answer your question, Chris, I think going forward, I think what we do when looking at all the training that we do is take a balance view on that. And it's about how successful and how appropriate is the training that we're provided and how does it lend itself to a blended approach. Now, some of it's great. You know, we, we find that, um, you know, it works really well. I think one of the key things, if you are going to do something blended, is having a platform. Because one of the things you do lose with, when you talk about it, virtual training, um, is that you lose that ability for that conversation, for that dialogue, for that um, interaction. I think that's one of the things I would like to see um, worked on going forward, is those platforms for that. Sure. From our from our point of view, we've only gone back to face to face training. We haven't explored blended learning. I'm open to exploring blended blended learning, uh, as as most as the trust would be as well. Most of our training, other than mapper training, has gone to online. Um, I think there's only a couple in hospital resource. That's we have an hospital resource while we're doing the mapper training, and uh, safer people are handling as as face to face. But everything else te has, has seemingly gone to to e-learning so it's something that we're willing to explore i suppose as i said before it's we are such a small trust that we've only by cancelling a couple of the map training sessions it's had a massive impact on our um, compliance percentage um, and we've gone down to lowest lowest we've ever been before um, and obviously reducing the amount of staff that were coming on because of the social distancing as well as that an impact so what we've had to do is we've started to to double up on training sessions so rather than doing one refresher we, we've had to start to do two it was this this is the first week we've started to do that actually and then in the new year we're going to have to look at doing concurrent sessions of a five-day course in one venue and a two-day course in it in another venue which is completely different to what we've done before and uh, what i'm absolutely open to discussions around blended learning uh, it would be interesting to, to to link in with cpr to see what options are out there and um, we've got our update next week so it might be something that we can explore uh, with this it's worth exploring Rob. i know we found um use <coughs> the blended model again it, it we, we haven't found that we can say right we're going down the blended route it's this way it will know why because i don't think that's a way to bring people on board and to engage with the services we tried that initially in the you know as soon as available so we can make sure people are safe what we're finding is that we actually need to to, to look at um perhaps the type of service where people are and the needs of those individuals. So some of our smaller social care services where perhaps you haven't got the maybe the tech or where people are working notice and then where they sit in a service, if you're in a residential service, it's somebody's home, you haven't necessarily you can't sit in their home on a computer doing your e-learning. Um, and then people might not have the tech at home. So some of the challenges we faced quite quickly organizationally was around tech and about what venues or what was appropriate types of services. We found our hospitals, where we may have suites for IT, were easier for our staff to do the e-learning elements before they came to the training. Uh, my, you know, There'll be a lot of the, the trainers from, from Submit on, on this conference who have pulled their hair out. The number of times people haven't done the training or turning up, no matter how much they've been nagged, or you know, so there's, there's a huge piece that goes with it. And you know, we're lucky as an organization to have quite a lot of um, people involved in supporting the delivery of training. But I think a blended approach and looking very carefully at you know where it suits, making sure you've got the infrastructure is really important to it being successful. We didn't have that luxury, it was a case of ah, all this is happening, you know, just trying to get computers or laptops or whatever it was was quite challenging at the early days of our, um, uh, the, uh, the pandemic. When you, when you think about that, guys, what really what we're talking about is future proofing um, our training so that we don't fall back into those early scary weeks again. Um, so what are some of your thoughts and plans around that organizationally for, for future proofing? Uh, if we were to find ourselves in a similar situation, or even, you, you, you know, you just feel this is the best way forward for our organization. It's interesting um, you, you, you asked that question, Christopher, because I think as an organization, the expectations are, um, particularly I know a signet, is that we do have a, um, a contingency plan. So, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Well, let me tell you, none of those contingency plans <laughs> covered what happens if we had a pandemic. And sure. <laughs> so um, I think what that's made us do is to look at the plans that we have got 
in a way to make sure, you know, particularly if there is systems outage, you know, the blended learning then doesn't lend itself to a systems outage. So it's really we've been we've been looking at all um, our contingency plans and how in light of the pandemic, where is it that we weren't as effective as we could have been, and what will we do different? So I think you know, to anybody who's on on this um, conference, perhaps revisiting those plans with a different set of eyes is really quite important because I think we've all got something to learn from the pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Being linked in with people that I wouldn't ordinarily be linked in with, within like we had a C CPAG, we call it, I think the term was, but having conversations with senior leaders in the in, in the trust, where ordinarily I probably wouldn't have them conversations, is a really important factor around right. And if this happens, what do we do around this? Uh, and that was the reason why Mapper was one of well the only trainer that went back to face to face, and it, it was not cancelled anymore. And I think future proofing the short the short term is to try and clear that backlog of people not being able to go on the training and getting people onto the training again. But looking further afield into the future is do we do something around the, the blended learning? Do we get that that cap capability and having them conversations? Yeah, for sure. And and Raf, just from from um, kind of a co-production and experts by experience, what is that? What has the last year and a half, two years meant? And I know you mentioned we can have video um, involvement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but if you have anything really specific that might be helpful for people who are considering kind of building that into their future presentations? Yeah. Well, no, I, I I feel like um, you know. Uh, I, I pressed yes on the poll because I wanted to be the one person that would say yes, but there was another 11. <laughs> I, um, my, 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 like my, my thoughts, just if, if I may comment um, first, yeah. I just feel like um, it's such an important element of what we do. It would, uh, there would be quite a lot of concerns to like move completely away from face-to-face. -face. I feel like we're all on the same page around that. I don't think there's a discussion around that. You know, mm -hmm. um, Could we do some more digital stuff maybe and the pandemic's given a good opportunity in terms of thinking about you know different ways we can use technology and but i think it should complement what we were doing ex what was ex um, happening before the pandemic as opposed to replacing anything so we can think of new ways to test theory because there's a real practical element to what we're doing here in terms of um, you know this specific work and perhaps rob that's why your organization took the decision to solely keep this is face to face and everything else digital. Because for me, from a co-production perspective, I can do a lot of the theory stuff, right? And ask people questions. And you know, me and Mandy right now we're working on um, you know looking at e-learning around co-production and stuff like that. And I can go and test how that is playing out in practice on the ground. And there's no harm in doing that. The issue, I guess, with, with what you guys have at hand is going down that that route. The, the, the practical testing out on the ground would actually be catastrophic. We need to see that, you know, the, the practical element in training, and that's how it gets tested out. So um, I feel like there there is a lot of opportunities uh, to come out of it, and I feel, um, you know, anything that we're doing around co-production can, you know, really be enhanced in terms of involving people with lived experience actually at the training, or either uh, through visuals, um, but. Um, where possible, thinking about digital elements, supporting the theory side to complement existing face-to-face -face training as opposed to, you know, because I feel like sometimes when we have the discussions around blended training, we somehow think digital and face-to-face -face are somehow antithetical to one another and they can't work in hand in hand. Um, I feel like we could potentially think, well, let's just do what we've always done because we know that it's worked and we've just been celebrating our successes and how far we've come, but also recognize that digital plays a big part in the world now and maybe we could actually have something additional to complement that recognizing um you know the the, the success of uh, the digital throughout um you know the pandemic so um, that, that's my penny worth for I'm sure just, for sure thanks for this one of the things around future proofing and something that i've kind of started talking about within the organization is around virtual reality and the um opportunities for vr training i think if we'd had um the and I'm talking about expertise, infrastructure, knowledge, the whole setup ready, knowing this pandemic was coming. I think all a lot of training could have still taken place, which would have alleviated some of the anxieties. I think Ronan uh, Mountcastle was saying about, you know, they had a lot of anxiety 
um, around the pandemic. And you know, the e-learning I don't think on its own, i.e. depending on the type of e-learning it is. And I, and I will put that caveat, you know, people bunch everything, they talk about blended learning, they talk about e-learning, they put everything into a box and it is about quality, like everything. Yeah. So when you've got a quality e-learning presentation, it can be just as effective as face-to-face, -face, if not more effective for some individuals, but we're talking about individuals here, and everybody has a different learning style, a different preference. Sure. Establishing that as an organization, I think for me would be the way forward. What is your preferred learning style? How do you like to do that? How do you like to learn? And tailoring stuff more to an individual's needs. <clears throat> Very difficult when you've got 10,000 staff. I appreciate, Rob, you might be thinking, how is she gonna do that? But I think being a bit more tuned into our staff will really get the best out of them. I really like that idea of it's the individual. And I think a lot of staff that come on to the training like to have that ability to have that conversation with the instructors. To have the conversation we're having this that we've got this problem this issue happening on the ward what can we do about it and being able to and for, for for the instructor as well for me having that links with the wards being able to see the people coming in and have that conversation about because one of the things we've implemented recently into the training is, is talking about safe wards so we're talking about safe wards and how, how can that have an input have an impact on the wards and I could, that could be done by e-learning but i don't think the passion that comes from the instructor potentially is going to be missed so the passion about the theoretical components around the de-escalation about the verbal escalation continuum all that kind of thing and the trauma-informed care and i think that that that's what will potentially be missed with with the e-learning uh, with the, the blended learning potentially but like i say it's it's and i completely agree with you raf because recently i've now got another dual role no longer an rpc and reducing restrictive practice i'm working in the digital clinical lead as well two days a week so working with the digital team, how we implement things onto wards, are mainly around uh, the, the, the EPR that we're using, but how we move forward and, and trust digitally. I think this time, 24 months ago, 18 months ago, we probably wouldn't have been thinking about anything digital. We're probably just carrying on up until the point of, like Chris said, they had the opportunity to do it, but not many, many people took it on. But because we've had the pandemic, uh, what do we do now? Okay, then we've had to do, we've had to adapt, we've had to change, progressing with that and how we keep keep some of the elements, but also introduce some of the elements that, we, that we'd that like to keep and enjoy. I, I think that's really important because if, if we take a breath, for instance, and say, right, we're coming towards the, the, the end of it, we hope, we think that's what evidence are, are, is showing us. But what were the best bits? What, what what have we really learned from that time? Because we've come through a difficult time from a training perspective, keeping staff safe, keeping um, um, clients and service users and patients safe, et cetera, et cetera. What are the best bits, guys? What should we be moving forward with? What have we learned? It's a very good question. I'm just having to try to think now. I think for me, it was the it's the the connectivity again because we we went for so long without seeing people as a training I, as working from home. Obviously, I was working in RPC, so I was on the wards and everything like that. But some of the instructors that that work in the team hadn't seen people for a long, long time, and having that connectivity with the participants and having them conversations about what's been happening over the last eighteen months, finding out what's been going on. Um, how long has it lasted since you lasted a refresher? What's been changed? And we still got the bad jokes that's in the, in, in the training. Um, mostly yes, but there are some new additions. But it's that connectivity and them conversations that we've had that I think I've will harness and keep. For sure. Mandy, uh, you're, you're, you're thinking. I'll go to Chris as you're thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm just see, looking at some of the questions people have, have, have popped into the chat. Um, a couple of points that um, people have put you know con concern about you know the learner doesn't really engage with the online portion of the blended training um i, th I think you know with, with with some learners adult learners <clears throat> uh, getting getting people to engage can be difficult you know uh, as adults we can be a bit cynical when it comes to learning new things particularly if we've got a lot of experience in in the field we work in um <clears throat> but i i also i'm sure people who are listening in who, who deliver training find even with full face-to-face -face training you get some learners who are very difficult to engage so <clears throat> I, th I think sometimes things like uh, 
but blended learning kind of gets a bad rap because of things like that, whereas actually the same is true of all learning. So I think if you develop training that's meaningful, relevant and engaging, interactive, recognises people come to the event with knowledge and skills <laughs> and that the event, the training is designed to enhance and strengthen those knowledge and skills, then, then to me, whether it's e-learning blended or face-to-face, -face, if it's designed well, it, it should deliver the outcome you're looking for. Um, I think <clears throat> um, there are challenges with the technology. I mean, I'm no technology uh, expert. I'm, I'm really quite poor, self-taught, so not very good. Uh, but, but I can get round. Uh, this format that we're using for the conference uh, is, you know, a, a, an example of a really good platform that can, again, enhance the quality of, of, of a virtual event compared to, you know, the Zoom or Teams, which I don't think is 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 as good so again finding finding ways in which to create a platform to engage learners is good and the other thing with blended learning that's important is there has to be some testing out of your participants so when they arrive in the face-to-face -face portion you, you know checking that what, what have you gained from the online uh, portion of this training so i think people if, if your training doesn't allow you to engage, then uh, again, it's not going to be of great quality. Um, and, and, you know, I guess the role of any instructor for any training event is, is to bring the experience of the learners into the space. So there's that interaction and that sharing, and that's what makes training great. Uh, the, the evidence suggests that uh, blended learning is as effective as face-to-face -face learning if the program's been designed well. So again, I just think fr from what we're trying to do to help instructors is develop the packages that give you the choice of blended should you wish, and the materials are designed to allow you to chew, uh, to deliver it in the way that suits your learners and your organisations. <laughs> And I think if we if we did have a, another pandemic, whether it was related to this or and something else in the future, I think the one thing we've all probably learned is how quickly we can put in measures that increase safety and we can still get by and do the job that we're employed to do. Uh, because one of the things you can't do in healthcare and social care and education, uh, maybe at schools were slightly different, but certainly health and social care, you, you, you can't just furlough all the staff and shut everywhere down because people still need that day-to-day -day support, you, you know. So I, I think it's probably got us to a, to a good place, really, even though it was uncomfortable at the beginning. So I, I think... I, th I think certainly CPI have learned a lot, and hopefully that that will continue to shape how we develop programs and resources and materials for for instructors and the people that you train. Chris, just out of interest, what well, I don't know if you know this question, if the answer to this question, how how many trusts, how many organisations have gone down the pure blended learning route, and how many organisations are staying face to face? Do you know? I I, I, I wouldn't know. Certainly, the people I've spoken to, it, it's a mixture. Uh, yeah. Some people have said, no, we're sticking with face-to-face because -face it's logistically it's just easier for us. Um, other organisations um, have, have relished it and said, you know, we, we've, put a, we've invested a lot of money, uh, infrastructure, so people can have access to computers easily enough. Um, you know, we've got all the admin who can set up all the seats, who can track people, make sure they've done what they need to do prior to the face, face-to-face. -face. So I think every organisation's been very different and, and what we've tried to do certainly with the second edition of materials is to make sure if you pick up the materials as the instructor everything is is, is there for what for what you need based on your delivery that suits your organization so i think it's just been a bit mixed and i'm, and I'm sure over time we'll see more use of blended but Again, for the type of training that we offer, I, I don't think you can ever get rid of the face-to-face. -face. Mm. Um, and, and again, the, the videos that Signet produced that we've used in our training, I, again, you can see there are some advantages that now we've got them, we'll, we'll keep them. You know, the benefit of real live video, people talking about their experiences, you, you know, 
<clears throat> that's far more um, impactful on the learner than an instructor just telling me about an individual they worked with. You know, so I think these elements that even if you go face to face full, there'll be elements of blended training that you'll probably see start to creep in. Um, I mean, we're doing a big piece of work on some video works that we'll we'll make available to instructors. And I, I, and I again, I think even if an instructor continues with face to face, we'll start to see people using elements uh, that would typically be considered e-learning or blended, even in face to face. So, uh, well, yeah, we we we've been using a video for a number of years. I know Tim mentioned it in the chat. It's around the Q and A with a, a past service user and how impactful that has been for the staff. She used to come to the, to the training on a five day course, but she stopped doing that prior to COVID actually a couple of, weeks, a couple of months before COVID. Um, but it was really impactful. And like I say, I haven't got any experience of being a service user, so I can talk about patients that I've nursed in the past, but that experience, that first hand experience and talking about that experience with the service user is really, really powerful. The problem is, the staff have seen it now. We've seen it a couple of times potentially. If it's been used for a couple of years, they might come back for a refresher. It's making sure that they are refreshed with mm -hmm. a new perspective, um, because it doesn't come become as impactful if you've seen it day in day. Well, year in year out. Uh, so it's about making sure that the the training package that is delivered is is as refreshed as possible. And Rob, where we found um, blended learning, particularly um, over the last few months, really um, where it's had an impact is on refreshers, because you've had staff who've been with us a number of years, who've been through the refresher process a number of times, they've got a resource that they can refer back to, so they can go back over their blended learning, or their e-learning elements, but they're coming with an expectation that they've remembered or they've increased their knowledge or, or brushed up on, on their knowledge. So it was just to take back to um, something I think we forget as uh, organisations and I think something I'm really passionate to try and um, encourage organisations and individuals who come into organisations to do. Um, it's around culture, it's around culture of learning, around developing, that you know, training and developing and learning doesn't all sit with one department. We all have responsibility. Yes, Chris, Chris, yes. I just had one question, just in, in terms of, um, you, you mentioned there was some, um, uh, some, some literature research conducted around blended being as effective as face-to-face. -face. Can, can you just elaborate on that? Because it would be interesting to know was that specifically around kind of um, the specific type of training that we're talking about, or was it more broader in terms of... It, 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 it's more broad around the, the effectiveness of training. And and certainly, probably it, it, the, the places that have been really at the forefront of um, blended learning has been universities. Um, you know, for, for many years, universities have used um, online platforms, e-learning, virtual learning, um, and, and, and again, so I think, I think the evidence is, is there. It, it, it's like anything, training is, is effective if it's designed well to give the learner the right knowledge, the right skills, and it's facilitated in a way that recognises and, and is, can be adapted to individual learning styles of the of the participants and the, the other thing that kind of gets missed out a little bit on on um effectiveness of, of learning formats blended or face-to-face -face or e-learning it's it's a factor um that is overlooked really and and that's the the learning transfer you, you know so if if i've done a course on any anything related to the job you know what what supports there for me when i get back to the workplace what's my manager doing to kind of check my knowledge and my competencies and supporting me then to apply that in the workplace yeah. um and and i think you know because what could happen you could get to be like rob do do a great a great event um facilitate facilitates it perfectly engages the learners great gets everybody to the competencies they need in the classroom but if then i walk back into my workplace and there's no coaching no support no follow-up if if i'm not putting the training into practice and my colleagues are kind of 
reflecting that back to me or if if my manager sees me have a conversation with let's say i'm in a healthcare environment if i'm speaking to a patient and and actually instead of diffusing and being calm and and being helpful i actually agitate the situation you know somebody's got to take time to speak to me and coach me and and and, and get me to understand how I can apply that learning in the workplace. And, and, and that's the bit that gets missed. But. And that's the important thing that the role plays, because it's a, it's a tough one for me, because you know, um, I'm sure um, Mandy will touch upon it as well, but we've got, uh, you know, like a fantastic module kind of thing called Achieve, which is very interactive and it incorporates videos. It's very visual and it's got, um, you know, a, 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 in essence, you can kind of select answers. And it's very smart because it changes every time if you try and restart and do a sneaky one. Um, as ref does sometimes but um it, I, I just feel like when it comes to this specific type of training it's quite different to for example universities and stuff and perhaps incomparable in some ways because i would look at the training for um you know rvr um, you know restraint instructors so on as almost a quality assurance process as well and um, i just put a poll in just around um, the potential safeguarding issues relating to new starters for instance because i i feel and face to face an instructor can really know who are where the strength is in the room and where some more focus may need to be and um you know it, it's almost like a, a little bit of a sieve it's a starting point and um could that potentially be lost moving away from that um but i feel like a, a balance in a kind of achieve way you know could, could in, in essence work because as you were pointing out chris if we are moving towards incorporating more digital could that be packaged together and then put on something similar to like what we've got mandy in terms of the the, the, the module side of things and that's why i was kind of saying earlier chris in terms of are, 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 are we really just not talking about complementing what we already have as opposed to replacing anything oh uh, def definitely uh, i mean it, it, it isn't an either or it, it it's finding a way to deliver tra it workplace training in the most effective way for each organization and and uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, whether it's 12 months from now or five years from now, um, if we were to come back and have the same conversation, I guess we'll get a, a, a similar kind of perspective. Some people will be using blended a little bit more. Some people uh, maybe a little bit less. But I think it will become part of how we how we learn and, and how our workforce learns. I, I can't see it ever going away, but I, I do see that certain types of training particularly when you try to develop people skills and competencies around uh, the role that you perform um I, I think there's always going to have to be an element of face-to-face -face facilitated with an experienced instructor who, who, who can bring the learners to that point of application in a classroom uh, so i think that'll never go away but i, I do think it, it won't we won't be having the conversations about either or better or worse. It will be what's the quality of the training we provide and what format is that accessible and delivered in and is it and is it designed in a way that <clears throat> at the end of it allows the learner to achieve the competencies and the learning outcomes that, that it, and, and in that sense, that's the ultimate test for any training, regardless of how it's delivered. If, if you're not getting the learner to the competencies and the learning outcomes, and then they aren't transferring in the workplace, then to me, that's that's poor training, regardless of delivery method. So it's, okay. it's interesting. Sorry, Chris, on, on that point, because it's truly been a conversation and like all good conversations, what happens, time flies, um, and I know people are, are will want a break before um, their workshops. Um, Raf, again, thank you so much for the workshop earlier and joining the conversation this afternoon. Mandy, again, so, so many thanks out to you. Rob, thank you for joining us. And, and um, Chris has always, um, um, you know, got some great ideas and, and thoughts um, around training. And from the crisis prevention point of view, I mean, he certainly is a great lead in development and, and delivery of, of the programs that you all enjoy. Guys, people who've been putting, um, you know, comments, questions and answers, they're really, really appreciated. I think a lot of them are more comments, kind of agreeing um, what your organizations have been doing similar. 
um, to, to the guys on the, on the panel. So again, thank you so much for that. We're going to bring the conversation to a close and you will see coming up on the screen um, directions for you um, how to get into um, your selected um, workshops. Again, guys, thank you so much and um, enjoy your workshops. Thank you for having me. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you, guys.